GoldenEye was released 25 years ago this month, and we thought we'd talk about the Bond movie that updated the suave secret agent for the post-Cold War era. Plus, you know, it's not like there's any other James Bond movie that we are going to be able to talk about at any time soon. Of course, there's a tendency to overstate how reliant the Bond movies were on the Cold War. Russia was often positioned as a potential enemy rather than as a material opponent. The adaptation of From Russia With Love swept out the Soviet spy agency Smirsch for the international terrorist cabal Spectre. It also got rid of the comma from the novel title, much to the frustration of grammar Nazis everywhere. Those are distinct from the real Nazis who appeared in the novelization Moonraker, who are themselves distinct from the eugenicists who appeared in the film Moonraker. There will be a test later. Along those lines, You Only Live Twice and The Spy Who Loved Me hinge on a third actor trying to turn the Cold War hot. Even in more directly antagonistic films such as For Your Eyes Only or A View to a Kill, the Soviets are not the primary antagonists of the story being told. Still, Bond was very much reliant on that Cold War milieu. After all, the entire espionage genre had largely been shaped and defined by the proxy war playing out between East and West, primarily in Europe and around the world. Part of what makes GoldenEye so interesting is that, in the midst of this massive social upheaval, it chose to position Bond himself as a constant. The brilliance of Pierce Brosnan's take on James Bond is often undervalued and underappreciated, particularly in hindsight. Brosnan offered a snapshot of the spy, who never quite came in from the cold. Still working for MI6, or have you decided to join the 21st century? <laughs> Brosnan's take on Bond exists largely as a reaction against Timothy Dalton's interpretation, that of his direct predecessor. There's a sense that the Living Daylights and License to Kill had undercut Bond by allowing him to be more emotional and unreliable, itself reflecting a changed world in the mid to late 1980s. GoldenEye almost seems to erase Dalton from the Bond canon. It casts the actor who was originally intended to replace Roger Moore, and the prologue is set in 1986, the year that Dalton took over the role. GoldenEye seems to almost suggest a world in which Timothy Dalton was never Bond, and the progression simply went from Roger Moore to Pierce Brosnan. Brosnan's version of Bond was himself consistently characterized with earlier interpretations. He's reintroduced in the present day, seducing a young woman who's been sent to evaluate him, and then hangs around a Monte Carlo casino in a nod to his earliest adventures in both prose and on screen. The press around the release of GoldenEye stressed that Bond was not going to be PC, that he was still sexist, that he was still a killer, and that removing those attributes or downplaying those attributes would undermine or undercut the character in popular culture. The advertising for GoldenEye reassured audiences that there was still one man they could count on. However, the genius of GoldenEye lies in how its portrayal of a static James Bond is juxtaposed with the changing world around him. This is true even of the film's production. Up until GoldenEye, key production positions tended to remain static. John Glenn had directed five consecutive Bond films, including License to Kill, and he'd worked as a second unit director on three others. Richard Maybaum wrote, or co-wrote, all but three of the 16 films to that point. Both of those individuals were completely gone from GoldenEye. In their place, director Martin Campbell was at that point best known for directing the gritty and apocalyptic BBC miniseries Edge of Darkness. Quick recommendation here if you haven't seen it, it's recently been remastered in HD and is well worth your time. If only to see the miniseries where Bob Peck, best known for his role in Jurassic Park, vetoed an ending by insisting, I am not turning into a fucking tree. Anyway. Working with cinematographer Phil Mayhew, Campbell grounds the movie with atmospheric lighting that enhances sets constructed in shades of brown and grey. Critic Todd McCarthy noted that the franchise pushed everything a bit further in GoldenEye. GoldenEye is notable, for example, for featuring the first actual sex scene in a Bond film. And no, you smartass in the back, the sequence in Never Say Never Again doesn't count. The result is a Bond movie that feels largely distinct. Some of these differences were controversial at the time and remain controversial in fandom. For example, the producers hired Luc Besson's composer Eric Serra after temping some of the movie with the soundtracks from The Femme Nikita and The Professional. When Serra turned in a minimalist, atmospheric and largely non-orchestral score, the producers reportedly panicked, screaming, this is not James Bond, this is a different film. In fact, John Altman was hired to rescore the tank chase at the last minute. Even then, there are elements of GoldenEye that feel unusual for a Bond film. Notably, Martin Campbell is willing to let large sequences play out in relative silence with just Foley sound effects. There are moments at the climax of the film that play almost like music videos without music. <laughs> However, 
The reason that GoldenEye works is because it occasionally feels like a different film. Bond should feel like a stranger in a strange land, having just skipped six tumultuous years in the real world. He should feel like a character who doesn't comfortably fit in this new world. Appropriately, this is also a large part of the charm of Tomorrow Never Dies. If GoldenEye proves that Bond can still work in a bold new world, then Tomorrow Never Dies constructs a more traditional Bond movie around him. That's the trouble with the world today. No one takes the time to do a really sinister interrogation anymore. I am to torture you if you don't do it. You have a doctorate in that too? No, no, no. This is more like a hobby. Goldeneye underscores this by emphasizing how the characters around Bond have changed, even as he remains static. This is perhaps most obvious with the film's villain, Alex Trevelyan. As with other old spies like Jack Wade or Valentin Sukovsky, Trevelyan's largely given up on the fantasy of state service. He doesn't even want to rule or destroy the world like many a megalomaniac before him. He just wants to burn London to the ground and steal bucket loads of cash. In the end, you're just a bank robber. Nothing more than a common thief. I am an exceptional thief. Trevelyan is a post-ideological opponent. He is a warning of what Bond might be. If Bond wasn't so steadfast and committed. If Bond had perhaps abandoned his ideology. Goldeneye also reframes its female characters. Natalia is hardly revolutionary, but the space afforded to her in its opening act is striking. She's given considerable agency and narrative space long before she meets Bond. Of course, Natalia is a very traditional Bond girl, even the film treats her more like a co-lead in the style of 90s action thrillers. She also serves to temper Bond's sexism. Bond's old-fashioned chauvinism appears positively charming when juxtaposed with Trevelyan's rapey behaviour and Boris's outright misogyny and creepiness. However, it's Xenia on a top who is the most striking. She's introduced as a counterpart to Bond, first appearing during a flirtatious chase in Monte Carlo, driving a race car against Bond's perfectly shaped, old and vulnerable vehicle. Xenia is subsequently properly introduced in a sequence that consciously mirrors the introduction of Bond in Dr. No, as an alluring stranger playing Baccarat and puffing on a cigarette in an upmarket casino. Xenia's obsession with sex and violence makes her a bold counterpart for Bond, an illustration of how much times have changed. What's particularly interesting about Goldeneye is the way in which the film leans into this tension. Repeatedly over the course of the film, Bond rejects and mocks any attempt at introspection. You're having a pleasant drive in the country and you've got to bring psychology into it. Of course, the first Irish actor to play James Bond would ensure that the character was impervious to psychoanalysis. To explain why this might be the case, I'm going to turn over the mic to respected Hollywood actor and adopted Dubliner, Matt Damon. What Freud said about the Irish is, we're the only people who were impervious to psychoanalysis. The very words I live by. However, Goldeneye makes a point of characters consistently puncture Bond's attempts to dismiss their psychoanalysis. In one of the film's most oft-quoted lines, M calls Bond out. I think you're a sexist, misogynist dinosaur, a relic of the Cold War. Indeed, it's notable that Goldeneye is the film that features a sequence in which Moneypenny suggests that she may actually have slept with Bond, but the experience was so unremarkable that she might also have completely forgotten about it. At the climax, Trevelyan himself taunts Bond. I might as well ask you if all the vodka martinis ever silence the screams of all the men you've killed. What if you find forgiveness in the arms of all those willing women? Golden understands that Bond's status as a man out of time isolates him. I'm alone. Aren't we all? This sequence gets an ironic echo later on, when Bond tells Natalia that his coldness is what keeps him alive. No. It's what keeps you alone. The audience knows enough to know the bitter sting of this conversation. Natalia herself will be gone by the start of the next film, replaced by the latest in a long line of interchangeable Bond girls. Bond himself will remain constant. There's something strangely poignant in the version of Bond presented in Goldeneye, a man out of time who has refused to change even as the world has changed around him. It's this tension that makes Goldeneye such a fantastic film. It's willingness to let Bond be Bond in a world where he doesn't necessarily fit any longer. There's something reassuring that stability, and perhaps something tragic too. I've been Darren Mooney, and this was In The Frame.